So what the hell is diabetes? There's a lot of people on the internet that talk about insulin resistance, diabetes, etc. And I mean, a, a lot of people to the point where it, it actually makes me quite nauseated. Everyone talks about how it's due to sugar, processed foods, the fact that you're fat, or maybe that you haven't exposed your butthole and testicles to the sun enough. Yes, you definitely heard that right. Those are becoming some of the most popular health trends for 2022. Exposing your butthole and your testicles to the sun. I, I fucking hate our society sometimes. Anyways, there's a lot of so-called experts that are spouting off all of this information, not really telling you exactly what's going on. Really, they're just coming around to the point in order to sell you some kind of bullshit product or sun tanning technique that actually doesn't work. So today, we are going to talk about what exactly is diabetes. But before we dive into that, welcome back to the program, you beautiful people. My name is Dr. Dan. I am a pharmacist turned obesity expert. And I need you to hit the subscribe button down below so that you don't miss another episode when they come out. As well, check me out on my other channels at the official Dr. Dan. We're on the tick, the talk, the gram, the book, you name it. We are out there as well. Check out our website, healthevolve.co, where you can get a whole bunch more resources as well. You can book a free consult with myself to see if you are a good fit for our weight management program. So today I'm going to specifically focus on type 2 diabetes. I'm sure many of you have heard of type 1 diabetes, but you should probably know that there's a type 3C, there's one called LATA, there's multiple variations of diabetes that are out there. Hell, I could do hours worth of content on all the various variations of what diabetes is. So we're going to focus on one specific type today. And the reason we're going to focus on type 2 diabetes, because that is the one that most people are referring to when they're talking about insulin resistance, as well, it's the one that people most relate to obesity and lifestyle factors and such. And further, it tends to be the one that comes on a little bit later in life. So type 2 diabetes is a chronic and progressive disease. And really, it is a matter of supply and demand issue when it comes to your blood sugar levels. It is largely driven by genetics. For example, if your parents or some other immediate family member has diabetes, there's a pretty good chance that you may develop diabetes as well. Other factors that may influence whether you develop type 2 diabetes or not would be things like a sedentary lifestyle, eating a lot of highly processed foods, living in a stressful environment or growing up in a stressful environment and continuing to stay in a stressful environment, and weight gain. Now, a lot of internet experts will say the reason you got type 2 diabetes is because your insulin was high or because you're fat. And really, this isn't giving us the whole story as to what exactly is going on. So yes, obesity and diabetes seem to be closely linked together in that 90% of the individuals that have type 2 diabetes also have obesity, but only about 20% of the individuals that have obesity have type 2 diabetes. So if it's just a matter of being fat, why doesn't everybody that have obesity have diabetes? Why is it only 20%? Further, it might be more of a fact of the type of fat and where that fat is located as to whether you're in a, at an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Now, another point to bring up here is that, yes, when people lose weight, they tend to be able to better regulate their blood sugar levels. However, again, it seems to be that there might be just closely linked together and we still have this chicken and egg type of question. You see, when most people set out to either manage their blood sugars or try to lose weight, what ends up happening is they put themselves into a calorie deficit, so they start reducing their portion sizes down, they likely start to increase their activity levels, and they might engage in other health behaviors that ultimately are going to help them to bring their blood sugar levels down and lose weight. So was it because of the weight loss that the blood sugar levels came down, or was it because of all of these health changes that they ultimately made? And in my opinion, we haven't fully teased this out as to which came first, which is actually the answer of it. In reality, it's probably a much more complex interplay of a number of different factors, because with anything in the body, it can't just be nice and simple and this or that. Anyways, moving on now, before we dive into what exactly type 2 diabetes is, we do need to review a little bit of biology. So first off, let's talk about blood sugar. So we obtain sugar from the food that we eat, but also our liver can create or release sugar to the bloodstream when we go long periods of time without eating. 
You see, your blood is continually transporting sugar throughout your bloodstream in order to provide your cells in your body the necessary sugar and energy so that they can do the cell things and, well, keep you alive. You can think of blood sugar kind of like the fuel of your body in order to keep you alive, similar to the fuel you put in your car keeps your car running. Now, if your blood sugar levels get too low, you can die. Kind of like if your car runs out of fuel, well, you're not driving anywhere. Now, if your blood sugar levels get too high, you can also die. It just usually takes a lot more time in most situations. And generally in type 2 diabetes, there's other complications and such that will arise before that actually occurs. And it's the elevated blood sugars for a long period of time that is more of our concern with individuals that have type 2 diabetes. Now, in order for our cells to take up and actually utilize the sugar in our bloodstream, we need a hormone called insulin. And insulin is produced by a little organ in our abdomen. It sits behind our liver, kind of below our stomach, and it's attached to our small intestine called the pancreas. And I like to think of insulin kind of like a key. And all the cells throughout your body have a locked door. Insulin can go to this door, open and unlock that door, opens it up, and allows sugar to go from your bloodstream to inside the cell so that the cell can utilize the sugar. Now, individuals that don't have diabetes, this whole insulin and sugar control system is very, very tightly regulated. And this is all done so that your sugars don't go too high and they don't go too low. You see, the overall goal is to avoid death here. So then, what happens in type 2 diabetes? So when it comes to type 2 diabetes, one of the first things that starts to happen is we start to develop what's called insulin resistance. It's exactly what it sounds like. Our cells become resistant to insulin. And going back to insulin being a key analogy, I like to think of it that our cells are putting more locks on their doors so that you need more keys or more insulin in order to open up that said door and move sugar from the bloodstream to inside of the cell. And as I said previously, there are a multitude of reasons as to why your cells will start putting on more locks and preventing or becoming resistant to insulin. It's likely partly due to genetics, accumulation of fat in the liver, sedentary lifestyle, and possibly even medications. Regardless, when insulin resistance first starts to happen, generally your pancreas and your body can keep up with the demand. So your insulin factory, which is the pancreas, can produce more insulin to provide more keys to unlock those doors and allow sugar to go from the bloodstream to inside of your cells. And so in this situation, when you go to get blood work done or you test your blood sugar levels, everything looks normal. Everything looks good. However, over time, your pancreas or insulin factory begins to break down and workers start to quit. So what happens then is that there is less insulin being produced, so there's less keys to open up those doors. At this point, with less keys to open up those doors, blood sugar or sugar from the bloodstream is not moving from the bloodstream to inside of the cell so your blood sugar levels start to rise. And it is generally at this point that individuals have blood work done and their doctor gives them the diagnosis of either diabetes, type 2 diabetes, or pre-diabetes. And the doctor might also tell you to make some lifestyle changes at this point, such as reducing your carb intake, increasing your activity levels, or they might go as far as starting you on medications such as metformin in order to help control those blood sugar levels. Now, when it comes to the lifestyle modifications, this is where the gym bros and internet experts like to shine. They will promote various products and particular diets, in particular low-carb, keto, or carnivore diets, as being the only way that you can control your diabetes. However, as I always say, sustainability and consistency are going to be the most important factors when it comes to any of these products or diets. So if a keto diet works for you and you can stay on a keto diet for the long term, fantastic. That is awesome. Please do not fucking offer me any of your cauliflower crust pizza. But for most people, keto, carnivore, low carb diets really aren't going to work. And in reality, they're not actually necessary to manage your blood sugar levels. For most people, I'm going to give you guys a set of basic guidelines that are ultimately going to help do wonders for your blood sugar management. The first one here is start moving. If you have that sedentary lifestyle, get moving. Incorporate a combination of both cardiovascular activities, such as walking, running, what have you, and resistance training, whether it's using bands or lifting weights, 
this is going to give you the most optimal results and probably is going to give you the best bang for your buck overall in helping to manage your blood sugar levels. Number two is going to come down to portion control. Increase that protein intake, increase your veggie intake, and yeah, reduce your carbohydrate portions down. In reality, most people that go keto or low carb actually bring their carb levels down to what a normal carb portion should be, which should be about a quarter of your plate and coming down from that half a plate size. They're never actually going to low carb or keto. They're just reducing how much carbs they should be taking in and getting closer to what the actual recommended amount is. And overall, increasing your protein, adding more veggies and reducing your carbs even slightly will likely have a good benefit on managing your blood sugar levels. Number three, weight loss. If it is possible for you to lose weight, if it is something that you can engage in and start putting yourself in a calorie deficit in order to manage your weight, fantastic. A five to 10% weight loss from your baseline level can do wonders for helping to manage your blood sugar levels. As I said, we don't know all the ins and the outs, but we do see that when an individual does lose weight, it does seem to help manage their blood sugars. And in reality, if you work on guideline point number one and two, you're probably going to see some weight loss anyways. And so overall, you're going to get a kind of a trifecta effect, hopefully, in managing your blood sugar levels. And finally, number four, manage your stress levels. That's going to be everything from getting a good night's sleep, from getting rid of the toxic partner or what have you in your life. It's going to be managing all of these things that cause things like cortisol in our levels or bodies to rise. Cortisol is our stress hormone. Our stress hormone is primarily there in order to increase blood sugar levels in order to get ready to fight or flight, essentially, right? So if we need more blood sugars to go to our muscles and stuff like that to get us ready to run or fight or do whatever we need to do, but we want to get those cortisol levels down when they're inappropriately high in stressful situations or because we're not sleeping well. So mitigating, managing those, going for a sleep to study, seeing if you have sleep apnea, getting on a CPAP machine if you need to, can do absolute wonders for managing your blood sugar levels. Now, obviously, there are a lot of other aspects and things that we can talk about and things that you can mitigate and change in trying to manage your type 2 diabetes, but this gives you a brief overview for today, so hopefully it was helpful. And if you happen to have type 2 diabetes or maybe you're concerned about developing it, this will give you the basic structure to at least get started. We're going to talk about more of this stuff in future videos, but for now, this is what I'll give you to kind of kick off here. Of course, if you have any questions, drop them down below. Also, check me out on my other channels at The Official Dr. Dan, where you can see me on the tick, the talk, the gram, the tweet. We're out there and you can ask questions there as well. I do my best to answer them all. I can't always get to them, but I do try my best. And of course, hit the subscribe button down below so you don't miss another episode. And finally, check out our website, healthevolve.co, where you can book a free consult with myself so that you can get to find out if I can help and support you with managing your blood sugar levels and managing your weight. And until next time, my friends, always remember that small tweaks lead to massive peaks.